I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. Barbara Giddings and Kayla Husen were a pair of happy warriors who battled their way through decades of the LGBT civil rights movement. Over two visits in the spring and winter of 1989, I spent five hours with Barbara and Kay in their cozy living room in Philadelphia. Barbara first found her way into the movement in the mid-1950s, and Kay found Barbara in 1961. Together, they devoted most of their lives to the cause. Now, I can't do justice to describing these two extraordinary people, so have a look at one of their early photographs on makinggayhistory.com. It'll light up your screen. Interview with Barbara Giddings and K. Tobin Lahusen, Wednesday, May 17th, 1989, at the home of Barbara and K. in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Interviewer is Eric Marcus, tape one, side one. K. K. Yeah, what? I need some coffee. I'm, I'm making right now. And the fruit we should get out that's oh. on the front porch. I just want to ask you about, uh, I'll save America. Bring you some little blue bowls. I'll save Americans for gay rights. Ah, yes. Bring out the fruit bowl from the... And there are a couple of knives I had out. Take care of your whistling. It never fails. I'm a musical person. I want a whistling kettle. I get a shrieking kettle. <laughs> we have a harmonic kettle. You do? What does it do? It's, uh, it, it Westminster this, chimes? It's frightening. It's, it's off-key. <laughs> when did the two of you first meet? 1961. Mm -hmm. At a picnic in mm -hmm. uh, Rhode Island, uh, whose purpose was to pull together some women to try to start a Daughters of Belitis chapter in uh, the New well, England area. Do you remember what you felt the first time you saw Barbara? The first time I saw her? No, I thought she was a very interesting person. <laughs> 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 I was quite taken with her. <laughs> and you? And I was taken with her. <laughs> I happened to answer the door when uh, she rang the bell for this uh, picnic, and I was very taken because this was not at all what I had expected. She expected some mousy little old lady, I think, to turn up when I turned up. Because I knew that she worked for the Christian Science Monitor, and my stereotypes were <laughs> such that I expected this rather mousy, <laughs> door type of person, and she was everything, anything but when she turned up at the door. You know, bright, cheerful colors and... Uh, red hair and uh, just awfully attractive. And we started talking and jabbering away. And you were coming from where at that time? You were visiting from what city? Well, I lived in Boston. I wrote to all of the women on DOB's mailing list who were within a hundred mile radius of um, Rhode Island and invited them to try to start a chapter up there. But that was a fortuitous invitation? Yes, very much so. <laughs> brought her into my life. Well, in those days, Eric, you have to realize that there were like, you know, five people who might have been <laughs> possible for the Rhode Island chapter. I mean, it was nothing. It was just a I think we had all of, all of 12 or 15 people at this picnic, and that was a big <laughs> turnout, really? a really big turnout in those days. Was it that many? It seemed, I think it was about that. What kinds of people came to the picnic? Well, we were certainly a motley crew in those were days. Married, I mean, people, women who came were married? married women, possible. Nobody stands out in my memory from that uh, particular time. Marge and time. her hopeless love for Jan. Jan didn't <laughs> reciprocate. And then an, an older woman who wasn't with anyone, but she told Barbara to go after me. I was a cute little package. <laughs> <laughs> Which really I, ticked me off. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's been a standing joke with us ever since. <laughs> but... I, frankly, Eric, in the beginning days of the movement, I'll tell you, the people who turned up were, by and large, pretty oddball. <laughs> you know, because in the early movement, the more... it was so such an unpopular right. thing to do. When most gay people were trying to blend in and pass. You were saying you had to be a little... Yes, you had to be a little bit mm. unconventional mm. to be willing to come out to to meetings of a group like that. And you had to have some reason to want a crusade, in spite of whatever it might cost you. You started in what? what got me started in the movement was 
I found in 1953 or so a book called The Homosexual in America, A Subjective yes. Approach by Donald Webster Corey. Yes. His book was very much a call to arms. He was saying that we ought to be working to, to gain our equality and our, and our civil rights. So I met him and found out from him that there were organizations of homosexual people. Was that a stunning revelation? Yes, yes, I didn't realize that there were such groups. We're using the term of the day, homosexual. Not gay. Right. Gay didn't come until the late 60s. Was so lesbian we used, used at the time? Mm -hmm. Yes, but not as much. Well, it was Homo in the statement of purpose of DOB, honey. Lesbian. The variant. Oh, the variant. That was the variant. <laughs> they didn't call her lesbian at all. They called her the variant. <laughs> never. Brilliant. Never. I forgot that. The variant. <laughs> so, but anyway, I found out from Corey about the existence um, of a, an organization called One Incorporated in Los Angeles. And lo and behold, the next uh, vacation that I had, I arranged to take a plane out to uh, Los Angeles. And they told me about the Mattachine Society in San Francisco. So I hopped another plane and went up to San Francisco and uh, talked to them. And they told me about the Daughters of Belitis, which had formed a year ago and was about to uh, start a magazine. And it was founded by? Uh, eight women, including Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. I did accept an invitation to come to a meeting. And then I found myself in a living room, in a normal social setting with 12 other lesbians. And it was a marvelous experience. And I just sat there sort of reveling in the company. Uh, it's, it wasn't a bar setting. These were nice women. And it made a big difference. But I didn't actually join Daughters of Belitis until two years later in 1958. So 58, you decided what made you decide I was invited on? by Dell and Phyllis in San Francisco to help start a New York chapter. I guess they had sized me up as someone who'd be willing to take the, uh, take the bit and run a little. How many women in, in the New York chapter when you started? Official members, you might have had 10. In all of New York City? <laughs> Official members, yes, but a lot more turned up for the, the social events, the, uh, what, the 30, public lectures. 35 if we were lucky. That was a lot. That for, was a lot. That was a lot for an invisible people at a time when you could hardly poke your nose out. Daughters of Belitis didn't have big public lectures. Mattachine did. But we, but we, co we members of Daughters of Belitis, would go. And sometimes we would co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. So we'd sort of hitch with Mattachine's big greater strength to to get our name onto something and it was usually a lecture on the law and changing the law or, or on changing homosexuality or it was some <laughs> psychotherapist yeah some shrink home. yeah some shrink looking for uh, for clients or uh, uh, to cure usually or or a gay therapist who wasn't out and who just got up and gave an academic <laughs> paper on uh, or there were there were Fritz. What did he always used to talk about? Monkeys and things, you know, homosexuality <laughs> and animals or something. I don't uh, <laughs> these lectures were really excuses to at get which, together. Yes, to get together and to, and to let people uh, come out a little bit. The content of the lecture really didn't matter that much. We really needed the recognition that we got from these people who were names in law and ministry and the mental health profession. They had a credential and they were willing to, to come and address a meeting of ours instead of ignoring us entirely. That was important. But just by coming? Just by coming and recognizing our existence and, and our being a legitimate audience, that gave us a boost. Most gay people <clears throat> in New York who had any kind of income were going to the therapist. What did the therapist tell them at this time? Usually trying to cure them. Fix them? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you see, I decided at 18 I was right and the world was wrong. <laughs> but uh, the people who were in New York were in that uh, intellectual uh, stew pot there, and the going theory at the time was that uh, you were sick and you should go to the doctor and get turned around, uh, deep analysis, find out what went wrong in your childhood, and so forth. Not too many people just... Uh, you know, thought for themselves and thought, you know, this is a crock of shit. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we'd have these events, and then Daughters of Belitis had uh, its own socials and what were called Gab and Java sessions, literally talk and coffee, and there was a topic uh, for discussion in the e that evening. Topics like uh, telling your parents, uh, going to the therapist, <laughs> Uh, legal legal issues, legal problems, whatever was the going... Should lesbians uh, wear skirts? Oh, yeah. Uh, acceptance by the world at large. Should lesbians wear skirts? Well, there was, oh, that was a big thing, yeah. yeah. 
But uh, Gus would tell endlessly about her therapist and what her therapist said. And <laughs> therapy was just Very big. Uh, the overriding thing then. I mean, law reform was secondary in politics. You know, and yet, I was, obviously, I was beginning to feel my crusading oats a little bit. I couldn't help it. And yet, I didn't have a very clear sense of what we were doing and why we were doing it. I sort of, we sort of bumbled along. But where we were going, if you'd asked me, I probably wouldn't have been able to say very clearly. Why did you develop an awareness? So then at this point, it's a big point. Well, Kay was, Kay was a big help because Kay's got a very, very clear mind and some very definite ideas about the world, well, much the more. the Mattachine guys pushed things along. After all, they did a sit-in in a bar and demanded to be served. This was the sip-in that I've interviewed a couple of people on this event. And, and that was watch. very important. Well, and we're moving along, but and this Randy coincided. Randy Wicker was the first to picket. He got out and picketed. Yes, the, he picketed know. at Whitehall Induction yeah. Center in 1962 or 1963. And yes, it was all very and this, exciting. this is beginning to filter through to me that that you could do things like but that. But I think even before the you know the the real activism, Barbara and I were unhappy with the Daughters of Belitis. Uh, posture and it was a kind of a scolding was, teacher attitude. It was now you lesbians had better put on a skirt and shape up and hold a job and go to work nine a.m. to five <laughs> and, and make the, yourselves acceptable and make to the world acceptable. and then you can expect something of the world right. in return. And then you know it was the you know the scolding the laggard lesbian right and we didn't that's somehow right. it really didn't sit well with us it was pointed toward the uh, ne'er do wells who would loll around in the gay bar all day long and um, and we didn't know as any if of those. as if this was the ma majority the, of us the most of us whereas the most of us really were in skirts already fitting in all too tightly right and with, <laughs> with uh, very painfully wearing the mask i know i did at the monitor I was in a skirt every day, fitting in all too tightly. We didn't like it, and we thought it was very demeaning, and we thought it was very inappropriate. And it seemed to me that at every national convention of Daughters of Belitis, Kay and I would come up with radical proposals right. that were always voted right. down. We, did, we didn't want the name. <laughs> we wanted the name we of wanted the magazine changed. We wanted memberships for men. We wanted associate yeah, memberships right. for men. We wanted to change the name of the magazine. See, we wanted to change the, the composition of the national board. The was called The Ladder because you were supposed to climb up the ladder. Did you ever see the covers of the first few And into the human issues? race on an OK basis. It's very badly drawn. The, the first six issues or so had this picture, uh, a ladder, literally, from some kind of a, a no, a muddy, muddy marshland <laughs> with some vaguely humanoid figures down there and this ladder up into the clouds and the sky. And it was real. Oh, this little lesbian is beginning to climb the ladder, <laughs> upgrading herself so that she will become I an think okay person instead of a, a variant who has a poor self-image, I think. who doesn't go to work nine to five, right. who doesn't hold a regular job, who isn't a participating member of society, as if there weren't thousands of lesbians who were already fitting you know, in all too well. Great contributors to society. No what recognition they needed, of them. Right. What they needed was support, uh, uh, help to get the bigots off their backs, right. and ways to meet other lesbians. They didn't need the, the, uh, the, 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 t the teaching. They didn't right. need to be taught. They really didn't need to have to learn that much right. about the themselves. But education of the variant was one of the big things in Daughters of Belitis. Well, we were sort of itching under all of this. And yet we stuck with Daughters of Belitis for several years, especially because DOB was then joining with several other gay groups uh, in the East to form what was called ECHO, East Coast Homophile Organizations. The word homophile was very big in the f late 50s and the early 60s. Homosexual was deemed too clinical, and so they tried to conjure up this word. Mm -hmm. Homophile that was the word they came up with. It was, also, it was also supposed to mean that you could be heterosexual and support the organization and belong to it. it the was, theory was you could make up your own <clears throat> word, but it never did sail. Anyway, we met Frank Kameny at one of the ECHO conferences. In the early 60s. Early 60s. He was fantastic. He'd been discharged. He was an astronomer and physicist. Did you read my chapter on him? I mean, <laughs> yes. he is so eccentric. You'll have to forgive a lot. I've met him. But he's worth I've it. But he was, he was a big influence on me because he had such a clear and compelling vision of what the movement should be doing. And, and it just, was... 
That was that we should be standing up and demanding our full equality and our full rights and the hell with the sickness issue. They put the label on us. They, they're the ones that, that need to justify it. Let them do their justification. We're not going you to help the them. The burden of proof is on them. In the absence of uh, valid evidence to the contrary, homosexuality is not a what it disease, is no kind impairment, of, right. blah, blah. <laughs> malfunction, disorder of any kind, it is fully on par with heterosexuality and fully the equal of it. And when he put that forward as a... Uh, credo. S yes, a credo for the movement in 1964, it was the most radical thing that had come down the pipe. And DOB said, no, we can't take a position on it. DOB was one of the groups that wouldn't go along they with said, it. They said, nobody will listen to us. We have to get the professionals to say we're okay. We so can't we say had better ourselves. help them with their research studies and all of that. And once the professionals say we're okay, then, we'll, then the world will accept it. And Frank said, this is rubbish. He <laughs> said, if we stand up and say we're right and nobody listens, we will not have lost anything. But if, if somebody listens, we will have gained something. Even if it's something. only one gay person who needs a and little reinforcement. Uh, even if it's only the gay people who listen, we will still have gained something. <laughs> So, anyway, so what happened we was, had, we, I were, we, were we were catapulted into this we were vigorous intellectual back and forth, we, where DOB was back in the mire of wanting to upgrade the variant, <laughs> and we were saying, to hell with this, there's nothing wrong with the variant, it's society. That's right, that was the shift that Frank helped uh, put into focus for us. Well, he packaged it. Well, he, and he, yes, he did, and he marketed it. That is, he really pushed for its acceptance by the ECHO affiliate organizations mm -hmm. at these ECHO meetings. Right. And of course, this was a very uneasy alliance because DOB wasn't ready to go along with all this stuff. Well, that's... And for one thing, it was the intellectual East versus San Francisco, <laughs> where they had nice coffee clutches and all that, right? And Florence said, um, yes, yes, this isn't the kind of subject matter that can be marketed like toothpaste. And he said, and oh, Frank yes, it said, can. unfortunately, this can be marketed like toothpaste. And, <laughs> and, I mean, you know, well, poor DOB, they had never been grabbed by the short hairs and shaken up this way in their lives, these San Francisco ladies. But what happened was we were editing the latter around that time. Well, Barbara was the editor. I was the nominal we editor. Worked. Actually, we both worked on it. Of the latter. And Eric, we would go out and would distribute it ourselves. We would go to newsstands. We had and to bookstores. Only two places in New York would mm -hmm. take it. We tried distributors; they wouldn't touch and it. This was a labor of love. You got to realize you're talking to two fanatics here. <laughs> I mean, we spent our own gas money and our own everything to do this. I mean, we were living on a shoestring. I mean, we are like, you know, the little old lady in tennis shoes. To use a sexist phrase, lady. We have a little old lady in tennis shoes here locally who's outside our supermarket handing out her socialist literature all the time. That's us in the gay movement, you know what I mean? <laughs> little old ladies in tennis shoes, living on a shoestring, totally fanatics, well, uh, caught up in a cause. You're caught up in it, and, and it, there, there's tremendous uh, reward. Sure, there are setbacks, but there's a satisfaction in, in seeing the accomplishment and seeing the progress forward. Um, for every setback, we've made three major uh, strides forward. Wouldn't have it any other way. I can't hmm. imagine not being gay. What would life have been like? Dull? Dismal? <laughs> decrepit? <laughs> I well, Barbara likes to say she's, she's a, um, she loves organizations, and she would have joined the conservation cause or oh, the, that's save true. the wilderness or joiner, save the whales sure. or something. But the gay but, movement is so much <clears throat> more fun. I've had such a good time. <laughs>If it sounds like Barbara and Kay's work on the latter was just the warm-up phase of their activism, well, that's because it was. By 1965, they were out on the picket line at the White House and the Pentagon with Frank Kameny for some of the first public protests by gay people. And even those historic protests were just a prelude to what Barbara and Kay did after the Stonewall Uprising. But these stories will have to wait until season two of Making Gay History. That's when we'll share another episode with Barbara and Kay. Barbara died on February 18, 2007. She was 74. Kay lives in an assisted living facility outside Philadelphia. She's 86. As always, thank you to our executive producer, Sarah Burningham, our audio engineer, Casey Holford, our social media guru, Hannah Moak, 
our webmaster, Jonathan Dozer Ezel, and our researcher, Zachary Seltzer. We had production help from Jenna Weiss Berman, and our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Media, with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division and One Archives Foundation. Funding is provided by the Arcus Foundation. Learn more about Arcus and its partners at arcusfoundation.org. Making Gay History is also made possible with support from the Ford Foundation, which is on the front lines of social change worldwide. And if you like what you've heard, and we hope that you did, please subscribe to Making Gay History on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also listen to all our episodes on makinggayhistory.com. So long, until next time. <laughs>